Okay, a very good morning and welcome to the 21st meeting of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee. We have no apologies for today's meeting. Our first item of business for today is a decision to take agenda items 4, 5 and 6 in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. So our next item is an evidence session on the Carers Assistance Carer Support Payment Scotland Regulations 2023. Carer Support Payment will replace Carers Allowance in Scotland. Next week we will hear from the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice and um, Social Security on these regulations and I refer members to papers one and two and I welcome to the meeting our panel. Fiona Colley, Head of Policy and Public Affairs, Scotland and Northern Ireland, Carers Scotland, who is joining us in the room. Good morning Fiona. And Maggie Chiwanza, Chief Executive of MECOP, Judith Patterson, Interim Co-Chair, Scottish Commission on Social Security, and Paul Trainer, Head of Scottish Young Carers Services Alliance, Carers Trust Scotland, who are all joining us remotely. So, good morning. And thank you all for accepting our invitation. Before we go ahead with our questions, there's a few things just to point out about the format of the meeting before we start. So please wait until I or the member asking the question say your name before speaking. <clears throat> Don't feel you all have to answer every question. And if you have nothing new to add to what's been said by others, then that's perfectly OK as well. Members and witnesses online, please allow our broadcasting colleagues a few seconds to turn your microphone on before you start to speak. And you can indicate with an R in the chat box in Zoom if you wish to come in on a question. And can I ask everyone to keep questions and answers as concise as possible? So I'm going to now invite members to ask questions in turn. And I'm going to start with Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kavina, and good morning. Uh, thank you all very much for coming along. Um, I wonder if I can start by maybe asking Fiona and Paul um, a question, picking up something that you had in your submission. Um, both Carers Trust Scotland and Carers Scotland do not accept Scottish Government's argument that extending payments might incentivise young carers to take on a larger caring role. Fiona, maybe I could just start with you and just say, why not? Um, I, I think, actually, there, one, there's no evidence that that will be the case. Um, but also, I think we actually need to meet young carers where they are. We know that young carers have significant levels of care and responsibilities. Um, and there seems to be no good reason to actually not support them. Um, and and when, when I looked at some of the, the, the information around the Young Carer Grant, for example, the numbers are claiming are, are relatively low and it's, it's based on 16 hours. And actually, um, only a certain percentage of young carers will actually even meet the threshold for the new carer support payment on 35 hours, um, where uh, um, within a household that a, carer, a young carer lives, there may well be an adult carer as well who may be claiming carer's allowance. But as I said, fundamentally, young carers are already providing significant levels of support. And at the moment, the proposals, um, the pro proposals indicate that we wouldn't actually provide financial support alongside that. Thank you. Paul, I don't know if you have anything you want to add in regard to what you put in your submission as well. I think just to re-echo what um, Fiona said, you know, it's unclear where Scottish Government's evidence is for them to take the position that care support payment to those aged 16 to 19 years old and full-time non-advanced education would incentivise young carers. And we'd like to see you know, how that decision was reached and a wee bit more information in relation to that. And 2022, in our young carer research, we found that 14% of young carers uh, were uh, providing uh, over 50 plus hours of care a week. Uh, and uh, those uh, around 36% were providing between 20 and 49 hours uh, per week. So it's not really about incentivising, it's about recognition that young carers are already undertaking significant caring roles. And uh, and they should be entitled to support uh, as a result uh, of that, because young carers are 
already you know undertaken uh, significant roles uh, and they, they're reporting that that is a key issue for them uh, thank you I, I don't know whether the other two witnesses want to add anything at this point I'll take silences no then uh, if I can move on then um, the other issue I think which probably all the witnesses argue is that the proposed rules on education create unnecessary complexity. Um, and again, I just wonder what the impact of that increased complexity might be. Um, I don't know if Maggie wants to start on that one or Paul. Paul, do you want to go first? Yeah, I, I'm happy to speak uh, on that one. So our view is that, um, do you know this rule of excluding only those aged 16 to 19 years old full-time non-advanced education does create a lot of complexity. Um, as the current rules uh, stand, all those unpaid carers you know, studying at part-time level of any age, uh, in advanced or non-advanced, would still be eligible for a uh, care support payment, as is still the rules currently for carers' allowance. And um, those studying at the same level, uh, sorry, those of the same age studying full time at advanced education level will be eligible for support. And those over the age of 20, regardless of their level of study, will be eligible for support. I mean, as the proposal currently stands, it creates a distinction between those in advanced and non advanced education. Um, and that can result you know, in uh, unpaid carers, uh, young carers, 16 to 19, and non-advanced to feel that their level of study is inferior, that they're undervalued in comparison to other uh, young carers. Now, a key point which is made by Scottish Government is care support payment as an income replacement benefit, and young carers aged 16 to 19 uh, years old in non-advanced education are not expected to be income earners, and support, support may be provided either through parents or guardians through a uh, child benefit as well as universal child tax credits if they're on low incomes. However, what we what we know is that many young people aged 16, 19 years old in full-time non-advanced education, and remember that's not just school, that's also those studying under HNC level at college, do supplement their finances by paid employment. And for many young carers and young adult carers, balancing paid employment, full-time study and caring responsibilities is simply just not possible. Um, so it's, and it's also really important to highlight our research shows that student carers are four times more likely to drop out of college or university uh, and study. And financial pressures have been identified as one of the key pressures uh, for this. Um, it creates an added complexity, uh, which we think is unnecessarily unnecessary. And as I said uh, earlier, Joe, uh, I would like to really see the evidence around, you know, the rationale of how this decision to only exclude those uh, who are aged 16 and 19 in full-time non-advanced education was reached. Uh, thank you. Fiona, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh, yes, I, I think um, uh, just to add around the, the, the issue of non-advanced um, education, and, and I think um, um, across the piece with young people, we, 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 we know there are different things that they want to study, and there's different things that they want to achieve, and some of the things that would be described as non-advanced are, are actually qualifications and support to, make, uh, to help young people become job-ready. Um, and I think there's a possibility of them missing out completely around support and, and, and perhaps making different decisions. So there's the, there's the, the possibility of unintended consequences uh, from restricting the benefit. Um, so I think it's just about it's about fairness and equity that the that, that, uh, you don't need to be doing something uh, at an advanced level or, or HNC, but you actually um, are, are doing something towards your future. Um, and for young people, uh, we, we need to be supporting that, and, and particularly for young carers. Thank you, Camilla. <clears throat> OK, thanks very much. That was helpful. So I'm now going to bring in Ros McCall. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, the regulations as laid provide for full-time young carers in non-advanced education to access care support payment in exceptional circumstances, such as when they have no parental support. Is this sufficient? Does the eligibility need to be widened? And one of my concerns is societal stigma. And um, what would your comments be on that 
given that uh, the, the, the process, um, sorry, without parental report, how do we widen it? If there's a stigma attached, and how do you combat that? And I'm kind of looking at Fiona there, but actually I wouldn't mind hearing from Paul and Maggie as well, if that's OK, especially on stigma. I, I, I think probably on this one, I, I'd probably um, a, a pass over to Paul, because I, I know the Carers Trust and, and Young Carers Alliance have been doing a lot of work on that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, we do welcome the extension to those with exceptional circumstances, but I think, to go back to the previous question, that then also adds an extra layer of complexity to the system as well. Um, and uh, what we would say is, you know, we are very much, and as it says in our submission, and as we've done through Throughout the consultation process, we believe that Scottish Government should extend uh, to no care support payment to all unpaid carers in advanced and non-advanced education. Um, for many uh, young carers who might be in situations uh, which would fit within these um, exceptional circumstances, um, it does add that extra level of um, support. Um, but again, I think it just... As, as I said, it just adds to that that wider complexity in relation to stigma. Now, obviously, um, Social Security Scotland have the um, you know the the ethos of dignity, fairness, and respect, and it's a really important that that recognising benefits as an entitlement, and that young carers, um, if they if come into the fold of entitlement for carer support payment, um, it's about income maximisation, ensuring that they're getting the financial support that they need and deserve. Um, and it, you know, it, it does take you know that cultural uh, shift for many of these children, young people. This will be the first time that they might be interacting with the benefit system as well. Um, and you know that requires support. It requires information. Uh, it requires a lot of outreach to ensure that, that, that these young people firstly know that they're eligible, um, and also support on how they can actually apply and the processes for doing so as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Maggie, if you could come in. Thank you. Um, I agree with uh, what my colleagues have already said, but just to emphasize that um, particularly to do with um, minority ethnic um, young carers uh, that we, 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 we support, I think already there is that cultural um, belief in some of them that it is their duty to, to be looking after uh, their parent or grandparents. So when they're interacting with, if they have to interact with social security in terms of accessing um, care allowance or the care support payment, it's very important that the information is, 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 is clear and, and, and that they are well supported to be in, advice that actually um, they can claim for this because there is a confidence thing as well and they can feel um, guilty and we've seen this in the experience that we're actually saying you need to do that because it will help you um, on top of your studies or uh, part-time work which they may be taking. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, can I just come back? Well, just one more. Because I guess I would rephrase the question just slightly because my understanding would be that the complexities would add to stigma. And I just really wanted your comments on that. Would you agree that that would, would possibly be a, a, the situation? Um, I'll probably say um, yes um, uh, and no in terms of uh, probably how it's, it's been set up. But actually, I think... It, the the importance which I'll continue to say is if there is information and clear messaging about okay. what these changes are that might uh, really uh, help explain things and that they can um, understand that um, the the process is is always been uh, complex but also I think it's more complex when there are changes and people when they are not very clear about how to go um, about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm now going to bring in Katie Clark. Thank you. And I'll direct my question to Paul in the first instance, if that's OK. Um, witnesses argue that the Young Carers Grant should be extended to 19-year-olds. Um, the Scottish Government is considering this, I understand. Um, is this a change that needs prioritised? And if so, why? Uh, um, definitely. So... 
Um, I think that's something that really uh, does need to be considered. So I think as noted in our written evidence to committee, if the policy is progressed as presented, um, we believe it's deeply unfair that 19-year-olds, uh, young adult carers studying in full-time non-advanced education uh, will not be entitled to either carer support payment or young carer grant. So this means that they will be the only unpaid carer group over the age of 16 that will won't be entitled to any financial support at all, um, and we don't believe, um, you know, that's treating you know this cohort of young adult carers within you know those core values that I talked about with Social Security Scotland of dignity, fairness, and respect. Instead, the immense contribution that these uh, young people provide to their care for person and to their wider society as a whole would be undervalued and without financial recognition. Um, so those who are 19, uh, it creates an anomaly um, if the regulations um, continue as, as planned. And it's really in that it's about fairness, it's about equity um, and, uh, and also about that recognition, recognising uh, uh, young care. So I would say that is a priority to be addressed um, for um, if the if the regulations uh, go through as as written. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> um, I think Fiona would like to come in on that. Yeah, and, and I, 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 at risk of, of repeating, but I, I think that is an absolute priority. And, and I think, in, um, obviously, the, the regulations for, for this benefit is, are, are being looked at the mo at the moment. But for the government to, to bring forward um, amendments to be to, to the, reg the legislation around young carers grant uh, as a matter of priority, um, because it is a loophole um, that I, I'm, I'm sure was not intended. Um, but we need to find a way to close it. Okay, thanks, Fiona. <clears throat> um, I don't think anybody else has indicated that they want to come in on that. So I'm going to move on to Marie McNair, who's joining us remotely. Thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, overpayments, but my general ob observation is that there's much to do after safe um, and secure transfer. Carers Alliance has been around for a long time, and it doesn't meet the needs of carers. Given the flaws that exist are long-standing, has there been any efforts by the UK government to consider major reforms? Fiona, I'll pop that to yourself if you want to maybe give your, your view on that. Um, I, I think there has been some work in relation, and, and I know our organisation at a UK level has been in, involved in a, a, across a number of years in, 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 in improving um, forms. I think the issue of overpayments is a really uh, challenging one, um, and the House of Commons actually um, undertook an inquiry uh, into it, and there was... Um, um, uh, the National Audit Office, as part of that, found that there was very few overpayments that were proven to be fraud. Um, uh, that a, a lot of it was around things that um, uh, uh, earnings were slightly over, um, sometimes by as little as a pound, um, or where people had fluctuating earnings. So the, the, there's a real challenge here about, about getting this right from the beginning with, with carer support payment, and I think we've got a real opportunity um, as well, because um, because of the cliff edge in the benefit, um, a, a, a carers can end up in, um, owing hundreds, if not thousands, um, in, in, in overpayments. So um, we really need to get this right um, um, with the new carer support payment. Thanks, Fiona. I totally agree with you there. I mean, the issue of overpayments is a real concern. Judith Scoss uh, made recommendations on this. Are you satisfied with the proposals to deal with overpayments from the Scottish Government? Um, well, I mean, to some extent, overpayments are uh, an inevitable consequence of entitlement to being dependent on, on, on earnings. So Scoss took the view that, that to tackle it required redesigning systems and entitlement rules. So we we made a number of recommendations about the systems to mitigate the risk. So, for example, it's the first time that Social Security Scotland will have administered an earnings test like this. It's complex, lots of new systems to set up. So one of the most important things is to um, learn lessons and learn them quickly so that they can pick up the, 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 the problems that, that are arising before they, before they get embedded. Um, but also... As Fiona had said, we've already learned a lot of lessons from the UK system. 
So we know what to expect. Um, and we know that um, having the right data feeds from, from HMRC to pick up changes in earnings, which is what causes overpayments by and large, the earnings are not reported and picked up and acted on quickly enough. That those data feeds are very important, but they're not sufficient. You also have to have the staff there ready to act on the data and to act quickly. So um, we've made a number of other recommendations on systems as well. And the Scottish Government have accepted all of those. We're pleased about that. We would like them to go further when they can on making changes in entitlement rules. Now, we understand why that's not something that can be done until after safe and secure transfer. Um, we don't want to, we agree that there shouldn't be a two-tier system, but we do think that to mitigate those overpayments, it does need changes to, and simplifications, mm -hmm. importantly, to those earnings rules. Thanks for that. Do any other witnesses have any kind of comment or suggestion to make about overpayments? Fiona. Um, I, I think um, that the, the level at which um, overpayments are reclaimed um, a, a, is one of a little bit of concern. Um, and I think we need to make sure that that's set at a, a reasonable level. Because, I, 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 you know, to re-emphasise, the National Audit Office found that very few were fraud. Very, very few simple mistakes. And I think that the... Um, um, the, the, the new system should try not to be as harsh. And, and, and if these are simple errors, um, to not seek, um, not seek repayment. So I think setting a, an, an arbitrary level um, is, is perhaps not helpful. Um, and I think that maybe needs to have a little bit of, a little bit of thought because I re-emphasise very few are fraud. Fiona. Thank I'm you. now going to believe. Sorry, Maria. I just I, Ros would like to just come in on that. Yeah, thank you, and sorry to, to, to come in, but obviously you've raised some very valid points uh, to both Judith and uh, and Fiona, because. Um, it, as Judith, as you said, it's, it's a, an inevitable consequence um, and we're looking at how we can in Social Security Scotland make sure that we minimise this as much as possible. So that then raises the question, what do we do if we have an inevitable consequence and how would you suggest we look at overpayments and what do we do if that situation occurs? Um, either Judith or Fiona, if you want to come back, because I know we're talking what we need to do, but I'd be interested to know what you think we should do. Thanks. Um, shall I come in? Thank you. Um, yeah, um, we, we have made quite a few recommendations. So I, I think what, what should be done is, is that the, the number of overpayments that happen in the first place should be reduced to a minimum. In other words, they should be de designed out of the system in the first place um, because the consequences for carers we, we know are distressing to, to have uh, a, a debt um, uh, and then to have to repay that over time and, and to deal with the financial consequences of that is distressing for, 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 for carers. And these these mistakes are, uh, they're, they're, they are mistakes, they're not deliberate. So I think designing it out. Um, we, we did make a couple of recommendations which have been accepted partially. So Fiona alluded to one which is maybe a write-off of small overpayments. So the DWP will write off a small overpayment of £65. Um, we're recommending that um, Social Security Scotland also writes off small overpayments. £65 is actually less than a week's worth of carer support payment, though. So um, is that the right level? Well, the Scottish Government says that they don't have the data, um, enough robust data to know how much it would cost to actually recover an, an overpayment. But um, it, it, it strikes me that £65 is, is perhaps setting the bar quite quite low and it could be better for carers and better for um, Social Security Scotland to, to, to look at that to look at that level. And the other important thing is that people have been told that they've got an overpayment and they have to recover it. At the moment, they have no right of appeal. Now, that doesn't sit very well with the rest of the system. Generally speaking, and people... That, you know, there is a right of appeal against any determination. And in terms of people, people's rights to Social Security, that comes along with having a right to, to, to appeal, and there isn't one 
here. Now that's something that's being looked at, um, but, but we would, uh, SCOS would like to see that changed and changed quickly so people can appeal. Okay, thanks. Okay. Just, I believe Maggie and Paul want to come in on this, so can I invite Maggie in? Thanks. Um, thank you. Um, my comments on the overpayments, are, although um, you know, the recommendation to ensure that uh, this is designed that you know there is minimum um, issues with that. But the concern is uh, when people are having caring role and and when they change or earnings change, they are they are trying to adjust whether it's to a new employment or they're trying to be focusing on the caring role. So some of these things can be easily missed. And as Fiona said, it's quite a, a low number. So for me, I probably would like to suggest that if there was a way that there can be a degree of um, flexibility in how that is managed with individuals because you know one shoe doesn't you know fit all people have got different circumstances and situations so maybe having a dialogue to ensure that people are already in distress situation stressed and dealing with all sorts um, are supported uh, in an empathetic and compassionate way uh, while we're finding a solution whether um, how long they're going to to repay that so that they don't get into debt, or uh, if there is an option that that can be uh, a, a, a written off, uh, because they're already, you know, producing hundreds and hundreds of hours and saving a lot of money uh, for the government. Thank you. Okay, can I bring in Paul? But can I just remind everyone, um, because of the time constraints that we've got, just to keep their their answers as as concise as possible. Thank you. You're on silent, Paul. Oh, yeah, I completely agree with everything that um, colleagues said. The greatest majority of overpayments are uh, usually due uh, because the unpaid carers haven't notified DWP around information around earnings, uh, around uh, what's deemed as reasonable practical timelines. I, I, what I would just like to add is I think the onus needs to be on Social Security in Scotland to ensure that there are systems in place which makes it easy for carers to declare their in their incomes in an un understandable and you know, clear information about how the, and processes for them to report on that. Okay, thank you very much. Can I just go back to Marie? If you get any further questions, if not, we can move on. Uh, thanks, Convener. Just for your indulgence, one more further question. Uh, obviously, uh, there's a really good discussion there about overpayment, but does the, the risk of overpayment outweigh the benefit of allowing advanced applications and, and advanced payments? And I'll pop it to whoever. Anyone can answer it, Paul. I think Fiona would like to come in on that. Fiona. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think in, in relation to um, um, advanced payments, I think that the, the proposal um, around um, when a person can apply for for carers allowance, uh, it's care support payment. No, still still caught in the old language. Um, um, it, it, it is it is to reduce those advanced options, and, and to me, there's something around that, that there's um, a. Um, at the moment, if somebody is claiming a disability benefit, they can look to claim carers' allowance at the same time. So it makes little sense for, for someone not to be able to clear, uh, put an application in for carer support payment. So I think there's just something about making the system as, as um, simple as possible for individuals, because carers are already dealing with enough. Um, so um, I, I, I don't think they outweigh one another. I think that uh, um, ensuring that people can make applications at the earliest point is, is critical. Thanks, Fiona. Paul, have you got anything you want to comment? No? OK. Uh, Convener, back to yourself. OK, thanks very much, Marie. Sure. I'm now going to invite... Paul O'Keenan. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and good morning to the panel, and thanks for being here. Um, I, I suppose I'm interested about uh, future changes and, and pace in terms of future changes. We know that the business and regular, uh, regulatory impact assessment set out kind of four policies. Um, once case transfer is completed, um, you know, things around wait times, what happens after a person dies, those sort of, sorts of issues. Um, I wonder... Um, 
if uh, panellists would be able to comment on which of those proposed future changes or what changes more generally should be prioritised uh, after case transfer uh, and why um, really you know, should we prioritise in that way. And I appreciate Paul and Maggie have been on the advisory group, so I wonder if maybe we want to start with Paul. Yeah, thank you, uh, Rob. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one to say in which order is the right order to prioritise these aspects, because extending eligibility will ultimately ensure that more unpaid carers get support uh, and recognition that both they need and deserve. Um, there are presidencies across, um, if we look at Young Carer Grant, you know, the aspect of combining hours already exists within that policy. Um, in some cases, what we would like to see is a clear timeline from the Scottish Government around when are these future changes going to be made. Um, there, there may be aspects of some of the changes, like the introduction um, of the additional payment for those who care for more than one disabled person, may be more complex than extending you know, the run-on period when, when a cared for person dies um, from eight to 12 weeks. Now, if uh, those... What I, I would say is that the priority should be to um, move these forward as quickly as we can to ensure that carers um, uh, get uh, uh, entitlement is extended to carers. Um, and if, if some of these things are quicker to do, those things should be done in a timely way. But what is missing at the moment, and I recognise it's, it's difficult at this stage, but we would like really clear guidance of when that's going to take place. Um, whereas some things which I recognise are a bit more complicated, like introducing the new payment for those that care for more than one disabled child, I, I appreciate it may take longer to come in. Um, I have no further comments to add. I agree with everything that Paul just said. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if maybe Fiona, have you, you got a view that I imagine may be similar? But... Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the timeline is critical. Um, I think we need a clear plan we need, so that we're ready to go when safe and secure transfer has actually happened. Um, I think, um, I, I suppose there are ones that are more simple, um, and, and, and I expect it, 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 it would make sense for some of those to to move more quickly um, but I think fundamentally some of the things around um, putting more money in carers pockets um, um, is critical so uh, for those who are caring for more than one person but equally around the earnings threshold and um, because we could make some changes um, I believe relatively easily um, by changing the figure for the earnings threshold um, because at the moment it's about 13 hours at the minimum wage um, and, and then you lose all entitlement and even if we were to bring it up um, to that, that uh, 16 hours at the real living wage that would put an extra £2,000 a year um, into carers' pockets, um, and, that, uh, uh, and in some ways the system would already be in place, so it would be about adjusting, um, well, in my view, about adjusting figures. But I can see, I, I definitely um, understand the attraction of, 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 uh, of trying to get the simple things like the run-on um, uh, uh, change very quickly, uh, but uh, um, fundamentally I think the priority is more money in carers' pockets. Thank you. Um, Quite helpfully, um, timescales was my next question, and actually looking at uh, the government's timescales, and quite helpfully, I think you've expressed there the, the desire to see that happen as quickly as possible. Um, I mean, the government have uh, kind of said that they recognise that carer support payment from launch will not immediately fully achieve all of the aims for carers, uh, and that their aims are intended to continue to guide the development of the benefit on an ongoing basis. Now, that does seem to me to be quite woolly. Um, I, I just wonder what discussion there has been with government about those hard and fast time scales that, that people are looking for. I don't want to bring Paul back in at this stage, perhaps, just because you had uh, started on this topic. Thanks, uh, Paul. Uh, and at present, I'm, I'm not aware of any discussion we've had with Scottish Government around uh, timelines for when these changes will be made. All that's, that has been said both to ourselves as a national care organisation and, and, and uh, you know, publicly is after a case transfer process, recognising that they have highlighted aspects which they are committed, that Scottish Government is committed to introduce, and including do you know, the commitment to the run-on, the commitment to add on um, the, additional, um, uh, the, uh, the additional payment for those who care for more than one uh, disabled uh, person. Um, 
and then the, the overarching commitments to explore and commitments to consider um, a range of other aspects. Um, what we, as I think we have highlighted in, 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 in within our submission, we would really like that some of, some of those um, a, a, a points which are in the commitments are, are accelerated, um, including, you know, a, addressing underlying entitlement has been a key one that we would, uh, really want to see um, some movement on. However, within the list and even within uh, Scottish Government's response uh, from Scots and also from the consultation, um, it seems to be quite low down on the priority list as a longer term consideration. OK, thank you. Um... And obviously, you mentioned SCOS there, and I know SCOS have uh, responded in terms of, of the broader aims and trying to achieve that. So I wonder if Judith might want to come in at this stage. Uh, yes, uh, that was very apparent that the aims of carer support payment are broader and more ambitious than carer's allowance, which is essentially the aim is earnings replacement. Um, carer support payment also aims to recognise the caring role um, by un unpaid carers. And... Uh, Scots talking to carers heard from carers that they didn't feel valued, they didn't feel their caring role was valued. So certainly from launch, um, those wider aims are not going to be achieved by carer support payment. So they will need to, there will need to be more changes to achieve that, that aim. But I would say that, um, I mean, carers allowance, the structure of it is much the same as it was in 1976 when it was first introduced. So a review is well overdue. So it's it's welcome to see that the Scottish Government has done a lot of advanced work to be ready to introduce changes as fast as possible. Um, so I think I, I think there's, there's, there's been that work will, will, will mean that there's no reason why it couldn't happen more quickly um, after the uh, safe and secure transfer is, is complete, which should happen first. The, the only view that Scots took was, was that they um, redesigned the earnings rules to to just reduce some of those barriers to carers who want to work should be feasible and should be a priority. We didn't take a view about, about when other changes should be made, but, I, but, it, but it seemed from what carers told us that, that changes aimed at recognising the role were a priority for, for those carers that we spoke to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kavina. <clears throat> OK, thanks very much. I'm now going to invite Bob Dorison. Thank you. Thank you, Kavina. Good, good morning, everyone. Um, the Business and Regulatory Impact Assessment uh, associated with uh, this piece of legislation says that there has been improved service from launch of this uh, carer support payment. Now, we have heard already that there is going to have to be incremental improvements and changes further down the line. I think everyone understands that. But at the start, what should that improved service look like from day one? If you like, I know Fiona Colley was trying to come in towards the end of the last question, maybe we'll take Fiona Colley first in that case. So from day one, what kind of improved service should carers expect? Um, well, well, first of all, about, about simplicity, um, about being able to, to access the benefit and being able to apply for it. And I think um, the ability to apply in different ways, um, I think, is critical. We need to make sure that the right information um, is available because this will be a change um, um, and there will be two different systems running at the same time, um, particularly when we're working with pilot areas. Um, so um, I think that we, we, we need to make sure that we get the right information out to people about um, about care support payment, and we need to make it as simple as possible. There is another bit of it that we think that, that, that we, we, we need to get better as well, and that's for those who have an underlying entitlement. And at the moment, they kind of get a letter saying, um, you're entitled, but we're not going to pay you. But you can take this letter somewhere else. So it's normally related to the pension service, and you may be eligible for pension credit. Um, but there, I think there's something around that about making a simple system to enable um, 
individuals to assess their, their eligibility without a full application, for example, um, and, and um, a, a, um, an agreement between um, the, the a Scottish Government, Social Security Scotland and the Pension Service to be able to try and share information, um, because we want to make this as simple as possible, because for, 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 for a Pen, pen, uh, pensioners, uh, people in the state pension who are carers, they could be eligible for things, even if they get a penny of pension credit, they could be el eligible for council tax reduction, they could be eligible for help with their rent and then other things. So we need to make some of these things as simple as possible as well. Okay. Uh, thank you for your colleague. I think you may have strayed into what my next question oh, may have been. Maybe not. Um, so, so I'm going to ask that now, but then after I've asked that, I'll bring you and maybe Paul could come in after that, because I saw him nodding his head there, and just for, for time, for, 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 yeah, uh, for the best use of time. So at the launch, carers will be signposted to other support. Some of the signposting will be there, but and the provision of wider support is meant to develop over time, and I think your colleague will start to move into that kind of area. Uh, what would your priorities be for what a wider support should look like to make it meaningful for carers, Fiona Colley? Oh, in terms of the, the, the wide uh, income maximisation, I think, is, is, is absolutely critical. And, and um, I'm a little bit wary of signposting, um, because that puts a lot of onus um, on, on the individual. Um, I, I, I think there's more that Social Security Scotland themselves can do in terms of income maximisation, particularly in terms of local advisors about making sure individuals um, are um, accessing the reserve benefit system, but also um, other supports that are available. So understanding and knowing that a carer centre is there and being able to make a, 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 a formal referral if that's possible. So I think there's some of those things that I think just, it makes more sense if we can make it easier for carers at every step of the journey. I think that's a very fair point for your colleague. For clarity, I, I should say, I think it's a signposting initially, but then that wider support should should follow, hopefully, in short order. Paul Trainer, do you want to add anything to this? I completely agree with everything that uh, Fiona said there. The only other aspect I, I would add is is you know it's about ensuring that uh, carers can get that information. You know, Social Security Scotland doesn't provide uh, advice advice on uh, reserve benefits. And one of the most underclaimed benefits, particularly for those with underlying entitlement, is pension credit. Um, we would like to see that there is more information and um, uh, around carers, particularly for those who apply for carers allowance and are told that they're not eligible due to underlying entitlement, around wider support that is available to them, such as what, what uh, Fiona highlighted um, uh, as well, we also would like to see that information is sent to those who are currently in receipt of carers allowance or care support payment much further in advance uh, before they lose entitlement for those approaching pen uh, state pension age. Um, currently, we've heard recently from an older adult carer who said that they were only informed uh, two months before they lost entitlement that they were going to lose entitlement. And um, as we know that the application process to apply for other benefits can be quite timely, we would like to see that to be increase to at least six months of those approaching state pension age uh, underlying entitlement. And so they are they have the information in advance to make these informed decisions. And that's something that Social Security Scotland could look to introduce as part of um, the as part of their communication process to, to carers and their service. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Trainer. I've got a final I think Maggie wants to come in oh, just before you go Maggie, on. Maggie my, yeah. my apologies. I wasn't aware of that, of course. Mm. That's right. Thank you. Um, obviously, I agree with what Fiona and Paul just said. Uh, I would like to come from also an equalities um, lens in that um, to make um, an improved service, it's, it's essential that the the information that is provided should be accessible, uh, clear, and unambiguous. Uh, because if it's not for some uh, of our equalities groups we represent with um, literacy issues or language re uh, requirements, it can pose a challenge of probably uh, having heightened and, and anxiety. So information that is, uh, is very is very important and obviously to, 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 to make it very easy for them to uh, access uh, the services. Thank you. Um, can you know that's actually a very helpful comment from Maggie, because my final question was going to be about whether we expect additional applications with the, with the Scottish uh, uh, carers 
payment. That I note that in the year 25-26, We'll be paying out £32 million more than we would have done had it been the uh, carers' allowance at a UK level, so more money into the pockets of carers, which is a good thing. But only £7 million of that is in relation to the, the increased eligibility criteria, if you like, so that for like uh, advanced full-time education applicants, for example, £7 million. So the rest of that is assumed to be a cumulative impact of more people applying for this new payment. So I think that goes on to Maggie's point about clear and accessibility. Do any of the, the witnesses want to say a little bit more about whether they think this new payment in itself will mean people who currently qualify for carers allowance and carers allowance supplement who don't apply for it will be emboldened to do so? Is this an opportunity? Well, because your colleague's nodding her head and she's in the room, <laughs> yeah. I apologise. Yeah, I well, uh, well, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and I, 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 I think um, we, we have, if we have positive information, uh, and we will have positive information around, around this, this, this new payment for carers. I think inevitably, inevitably, those who may have not claimed before um, may come forward and claim, and, and equally those who are um, perhaps receiving the carer element under universal credit. Um, um, may consider um, claiming care support payment, which would then make them eligible for carers allowance supplement. Um, so, so, th so there's a kind of two two strands to that. But I think, I, I think absolutely. I believe Maggie wants to come in, but I am conscious of time. So, if you can be as concise as possible, thank you. Uh, thank you, convener. I think there's a real opportunity as well in terms of also increasing the uptake from uh, minority ethnic uh, communities. We we know that at the moment there's what um, low uptake, uh, and so by providing uh, good information and support, I think that might there's a real opportunity to improve that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm now going to bring in James Dorman, who's joining us remotely. Thank you, convener. Um, this is for Scots. Do the regulations as laid accurately reflect the Scottish Government's policy intentions? Um, thank you for that question. It is the most complex benefit in, in our view to be devolved so far in terms of all the multiple interactions that there are. Um, with reserved benefits in particular, but actually also with Scottish benefits now as well. So carer support payment interacts with young carer grant. So um, we did see in the draft regulations in those areas in particular of interaction challenges to draft the regulations accurately to cover, to cover those interactions. Um, as we identified those issues, we were talking to the Scottish Government as we went along through the scrutiny process and they were making changes where they could in response through the process. And we, we had sight of those in, in terms of new drafts of regulations. And that was fine. Some of the um, recommendations that we made, we, we didn't see the resulting change, although the Scottish Government did accept the recommendations that we made. Um, they accepted it and in their report to SCOS very helpfully set out their response in detail. So it, it seemed to us that um, the issue was communicated and, and understood. Um, but I can't say that SCOS then went back and conducted a follow-up scrutiny of the regulations as laid. So we haven't cross-checked that all the changes that Scottish Government accepted and said they would make in response to the recommendation now do um, completely... Um, uh, 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 reflect the, the policy intention. Okay, so so at this stage, you you're not quite sure if it's if it's uh, completely tied up. But uh, I wonder, uh, this is for yourself and the other witnesses. If there's any other issues in the regulations that uh, you would wish to highlight for discussion with the cabinet secretary when she comes next week. Um, did it? Um, you first, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I, I think we, we, we've made um, a, quite a lot of recommendations and they've all been accepted, um, uh, uh, either fully or, or, or in some cases partially. So, so I think I'm sort of content that SCOS has made the, the, the case that we want to make. Thank you very much. Uh, any other witness? Um, I believe Fiona would like to come in. 
Um, I, I think probably uh, the, the area of concern is around uh, payment frequency. Um, and uh, currently, individuals can receive uh, weekly payments um, under carers' allowance. Um, um, under the, the, the proposals um, um, as laid, um, it would only be those who are caring for someone with a terminal illness. And, and this is important because those who, are, uh, who will be safely and secured a safely and secure transfer um, will be given the option of, of a four weekly or weekly, um, but they won't be able to change back. Um, and, and so I think that we, we, we need to have some more thought um, about that flexibility for individuals to, to choose how a benefit is paid um, um, uh, to support their finan family financial situation. Um, so we've got a few concerns around that. Yeah, Thanks, thank Rona. That's really helpful. So that's come to the end of our questions. And I want to thank all our witnesses for taking part and sharing your expertise today. I am now going to briefly suspend the meeting to allow for witnesses to leave and to set up for our next item. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, welcome back. And our next item is an evidence session on the pre-budget. I refer members to papers three and four. 
So today we are going to discuss budget priorities in general terms and explore the context for decision making on the Scottish budget. So I welcome to the meeting our panel, Chris Burke, Deputy Director for Scotland, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, Emma Congrave, Deputy Director, Senior Knowledge Exchange Fellow, Fraser of Allender Institute, Dr Alison Hosey, Researcher, Scottish Human Rights Commission, and Bill Scott, Chair of our Poverty and Inequality Commission. So I would like to thank you all for joining us today. And um, I am now going to invite our uh, members for um, questions. So the first one is me. So um, in what ways do you think the impact of the cost of living crisis should influence the Scottish <laughs> Government's budget decisions? And I'm actually going to put that to Emma to begin with. Thank you, convener, um, and thank you for inviting us here today. Um, so in terms of how uh, the current um, cost of living crisis should impact on budget decisions, I mean, our um, approach to this would be around ensuring that there is a process in place to um, understand what the priorities are for the government um, and how the cost of living has impacted on those groups um, that are priorities. So clearly the most um, obvious example is around child poverty, given we have the child poverty targets and um, many um, affirmations of how important this is to, to, the, to the new First Minister uh, and others in the Cabinet. So, so what we would be looking for in terms of the budget is that clear articulation through um, the announcements and with supporting analysis that shows why decisions have been taken, why more money has been put into some areas. Um, make, that could be additional cost of living payments or increases to benefits, um, along with an explanation of what impact um, the government will expect that to have on the people it's trying to target. So that's a really key priority for us during this budget because we know there are such challenges in terms of the fiscal outlook, there has to be a really clear approach in order to justifying and prioritising spend, be that for cost of living payments or, or um, any other uh, new policies that come through the budget. And on the, on the sort of flip side of that is where money needs to be moved around the budget. Um, so some money may need to be uh, taken out of some areas um, that is understandable that the government may need to do that at this time because of the pressures on um, on the finances but again we need a really clear articulation and understanding of what the impact of that will be to ensure there aren't any of the unintended consequences in terms of these uh, priority uh, groups that, that the government needs to um, uh, focus on. Okay thanks very much Emma. I don't know if anyone would like to come in. Uh, Bill I'm going to invite you in thanks. Yeah, um, during the past, thank you, thank you, uh, convener and members. Um, during the past year, the, the Poverty and Inequality Commission and our experts by experience panel, who are made up of people with lived experience of poverty, have been visiting uh, local uh, frontline organisations who work with, directly with people in poverty. And we visited 20 organisations across 10 local authority areas, everywhere from Shetland down to the borders. Um, and what we've been hearing back is they've never been under so much pressure uh, in terms of demand, uh, particularly advice services, um, but also, you know, uh, food co-ops, uh, etc. Any, anywhere where people could get help with the cost of living and, and the way that it's impacting on them. And I think one of the things to emphasise is that the cost of living crisis is not over for those on the lowest incomes. Far from it. Um, energy prices are still nearly twice as high as they were two years ago, but the amount of help that's coming from the UK government is far, far less than it was uh, last winter. So those families are facing an extremely difficult winter, and the services that they're relying on, those frontline services often provided by the third sector, they're under huge pressure. And, you know, to quote, never before have we had this sort of volume of people who have felt that there's no way out. 
So if people are phoning up or coming in who are suicidal with, with the worry that they're facing about being unable to pay bills, unable, unable to put food on the table for their children, or you know, to keep their home warm. So what we need to see in the budget is exactly what Emma's been talking about, you know, a prioritisation of help for, for those families who need it most. And you know, if money needs to be reprioritised for that to be done and, and to set out why that's been done and where the money is being moved from and to and what the consequences of that might be, because we know that it will have impacts on other services. The programme for government was relatively quiet on what other support might be forthcoming, and that's why we're looking to the budget now to, to see how exactly that prioritisation of child poverty reduction is going to be addressed in, in the budget. I think some very welcome announcements have been made in the programme for government about raising uh, disability benefits and the uh, Scottish child payment in, in line with inflation, but we need to see more, uh, I think, and some of that will have to be crisis management for those families because the Scottish child payment has been a lifeline for many of those families, but there are other groups who haven't received as much support out with some of the priorities for the, the Commission, but young single people, uh, young couples without children, disabled people, um, older people have, have been left out of the help to an extent because it's been concentrated on families with children. Some of those individuals and couples are in real difficulty and they need help as well. Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Um, I'm now going to invite Paul O'Kainan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I, I suppose following on from, from that exchange around uh, prioritisation uh, in the budget, uh, last week, Neil Gray at committee um, said that the Parental Transition Fund can't be delivered uh, as intended, so the £15 million that was earmarked in terms of that fund has been redirected uh, to the fuel, fuel insecurity fund. So I, I'm just keen to understand people's views of is that, you know, in terms of that reprioritisation, what does that say perhaps about government's priorities and is that the sort of uh, direction of travel we would want to see? Um, so maybe start with Chris, if possible. Sure. I think um, that decision gives me two worries, I suppose. The first one is the parental transition fund and the extension of employability services, which are announced in Best Start Bright Futures, are now both apparently canned. And in that delivery plan, supporting parents into employment was seen as a good medium to long term goal to help drive down levels of child poverty. And that's certainly something which we would, would encourage and, and agree with. But to see those two areas now being put to the side by the Scottish Government, I think is deeply concerning. Now, we've heard warm words about that remaining part of the priorities of government, as of course it should be, but it, it strikes me that the government are a wee bit stuck in this space. We keep, you know, they keep saying to people like us, oh, where are the solutions? These were solutions which have now been binned. Now, to suggest that fuel insecurity is not a priority, as from the convener's first question, and as Bill has very rightly highlighted, the cost of living crisis is not over. In fact, it's raging. So I, I do not have any problem whatsoever with additional funds being put into fuel insecurity fund, of course. But is, are those the two competing priorities that we need to look at? I wouldn't say so. And the second thing I think is a more general worry, and this isn't just from the Scottish Government, is this again is a, an area where there appears to have been uh, apparently impassable um, divide between reserved and devolved powers. So the Scottish Government have approached the UK Government about a particular thing. They've said, oh, well, this will impact on people's, um, people's ability to access reserve benefits. That may well be true, but we have a fiscal framework for dealing with, with how devolved areas will impact on reserved areas. Now, I know they were talking about doing this through local government payments, so maybe that makes it, but it, it just strikes me that, again, we cannot have a situation where the reserve devolved line in areas where we are looking to support people who desperately need it 
and who we believe that this is a sustainable route out of poverty for parents of getting them into employment, we cannot have governments not able to make decisions on behalf of those people in an effective way. So uh, those would be my two main worries about it. If, I, I, just, um, I know uh, Dr Jose wants to come in, but I saw Emma kind of nodding as well. And I'm just keen to understand, that in terms of that prioritisation, your view, and then perhaps following on from Chris's final point there about are these challenges surmountable? You know, can we do more in, in, in that reserved of all space? But I'll come to Dr Jose first, if that's... Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, I think following on from what my colleagues have said, is in, in relation to prioritisation, um, we're about to bring in the Human Rights Bill, and one of the aspects that comes with that is looking at your minimum essential needs, meeting those minimum essential needs, and it provides a framework for looking at how you prioritise. And I think it's important that within the crisis um, of living, cost of living crisis that we have at the moment, that we have to be flexible, we have to continually be looking at what we are prioritising, but it has to be around that framework. We have to meet essential needs. And I think that's where we're not, that's not our starting point at the moment. Um, in making those decisions, um, it's not the Commission's position to say you should be spending X percent more on this or X percent more on that. Um, and later down the line, it wouldn't be the court's decision to say that either. Our, our position is that it's not sufficient what you're doing in this area and you need to be looking at, at doing more. And in that, we have this commitment to maximising our available resources. So we have to use our resources that we currently have efficiently and effectively. But we also have to commit to looking at all other alternatives. And that does include looking at taxation and looking how we generate resources. So instead of always starting, there wasn't anything in the preparation questions today around, are we generating enough resources? Are we looking at taxation as another option as well as prioritisation? Thanks. Thank you. Um um, and just to come back on your questions, um, so my um, my feelings on the the issue around that prioritisation and the the, the movement of, of funds. Um, so I agree with, with with Chris and its note that this is you know the second year that we've seen some some sort of late on uh, movements of, of money when it's become clear for whatever reason that that they can't be delivered as envisaged or other other priorities have taken over. I think my concern is that these issues, um, that these policies are being put, in, put into budget documents and, um, and action plans and without there having been that um, work put in to, to find out if it can actually be done. Um, and this relates to one of the points in my briefing to the committee about um, how often we see money um, being allocated to funds um, without there being much detail at the time of the announcement on what that fund is um, going to do, what, uh, what the details are underneath it. Um, and that means that, that it, it allows sometimes, and I'm not against funds being allocated, there are some very good funds out there, um, but it does mean that you can make an announcement without having to actually have gone through all the workings. And, and that's a concern in terms of then actually the uh, policies not being able to be delivered. So it looks like something's being done, but actually um, nothing is, is actually happening at, at, at that moment in time. And as we've seen, sometimes it, they just can't be followed through. So that's the main worry, I think, from, a, from thinking ahead to the next budget. If we have those same kinds of announcements over a fund to do this, a fund to do that, without that detail behind it, it's hard to have a lot of confidence in, in what will be achieved. And I, I, the issue around um, reserved and uh, devolved benefits, um, sorry, well, areas of, of powers. We've seen this over the last few years in a number of areas around uncertainty, really, lots of these grey areas in terms of actually what will be the implications if, if the Scottish Government went ahead with a policy it may infringe on on, um, on reserved areas um, and it is concerning that this happens although it's understandable particularly around some of the issues in sort of employability employment social security because there are both these reserved and devolved powers in the same area um, what it what it usually means is that no one can say ex with full confidence exactly what's going to happen so the UK government won't say exactly if it's going to try and you know rein back money um, 
but it, there's a threat. There's always a threat there, and I think it does really slow down um, the policy making process, makes lots of decisions hard to, to take with certainty, um, and it would. It feels like we, we do need a much better way of resolving those issues with the UK government quickly. And so it's, it's understood up front um, what the implications are and a proportionate view is taken of, of what should happen as a result. But we're not in that position at the moment and it, it's, uh, it's concerning. I believe Bill would like to come in and then I'm going to move on because I am conscious of time. Thank you. Two, two very quick points. I mean, fully agree with everything that's been said already, but particularly on Chris's point that in terms of the approach to tackling child poverty, you need a balanced approach. You can't rely totally on Social Security, and therefore employability is one of the big key strands trying to move people into well-paid work where they can escape poverty on a long-term basis rather than you know, dealing with, with a the fact that they're on a low income because they're either unemployed or underemployed. So moving that money you know, from one pot to another, yes, fuel insecurity is very, very important at the moment, but so too is employability. Um, and the other thing is that this was a solution that was favoured very much by the people at the sharp end. This came from parents themselves, this idea of the parental transition fund. And that's why you know, abandoning it is abandoning one of the solutions that they've come up with. And a very similar fund operates in Northern Ireland. So we're back into this you know, disagreement about you know, how Social Security operates. And Northern Ireland has almost complete control of its devolved benefits. We don't um, because of the overlaps with, with the, the reserve benefits. Um, and we need to resolve this. Um, so that real, genuine solutions can work for the people who know what they need in terms of support. Um, and th they very much favour this means of delivering that support. So, you know, it is a real shame that it's been dropped. And the other thing, finally, we need, we need to work out a way, or the Scottish Government needs to tell us how it came to the, these, these sort of decisions, because... It's not clear to the Commission how you know, one thing is prior, prioritised over another. What, what other options were considered and why were they discounted? You know, because you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's important to know that, I think, in terms of setting your budget, so that you can see the decision-making process and you can see, OK, they, they, they looked at whether it could be moved over there and unfortunately it couldn't or, or whatever. And then we've got a clearer understanding of why they felt it had to go into fuel and security fund rather than rather than back into employability in another forum. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, Bill. I'm now going to invite Jeremy Balfour in. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, and good morning to the panel. I wonder if I can move us on. Obviously, we're looking at this coming budget coming forth, but we also got to look beyond that. So, 27-28, the Scottish Fiscal Commission tells us that we're going to have a, a deficit of 1.3 billion within this. Um, I suppose maybe start with you, Emma, but others can jump in. How do we start tackling that deficit? Or do we start tackling that deficit now? Or do we just leave it and push it down the track? And if we do start tackling it now, how? <laughs> and you've got two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it would be um, very risky to, to be pushing it down the road and, and hoping that maybe um, certain more beneficial economic news comes down the track, which, which helps to close some of that gap. Um, but actually, I mean, I, I think the Scottish Government are very aware that they, they need to be thinking very carefully now about how they have the rights um, processes and contingencies in place to ensure um, that obviously that there, there is no choice. They have to be able to, um, to close that gap um, and have to know how they're going to do it. Um, I think the, the point for, for us and for those outside of government um, and for, for the parliament is understanding, as I've already mentioned and, and as has built, how the decisions are come to. We fully expect that there are going to have to be some really difficult decisions made in how to close that gap. 
Um, there may have to be um, a change in direction in some of the, um, the, the, the policies that are currently offered on a universal basis that, that may need to change. Um, there may need to be changes to allocations um, to certain services. Um, we expect that there will need to be those type of decisions made. And, I mean, the Fraser Valander does not have a view on what's the rights or wrongs of this. It's more that we um, are very keen that um, it's, there is a transparent process in place to ensure that the, the pros and cons have been thought through and that it's, it's very clear um, to, to the country um, what, has been, what decisions have been made and why. Uh, and I think that's the best way that you, you can actually make these difficult decisions as well. You know, if people are seeing a service taken away from them, um, maybe some better off households, that kind of understanding that that has had to happen because the money needs to be better targeted, you know. But, um, and, and that needs quite a lot of potential lead in time for people to, to understand the situation rather than, you know, things being done at the last minute. So um, we, we would hope to see that kind of, Sort of grown-up conversation being um, part of, of from this budget onwards, in light of what the, the, the fiscal gap that we're looking at. Alison, can I bring you in? Yeah, I, I think transparency is is absolutely critical to that. People being able to understand why decisions are being made, um, it helps to understand how to to take a, a fair process, how to make sure that that decisions um, are understood, even if they're not enjoyed. Um, and I think. Starting from the perspective of, you know, what is it we're trying to achieve? What outcomes do we want to have? How do we see we're going to achieve those? And how do we, what, what, how much is that going to cost? And how do we generate the resources to achieve that? I think we need to start from that and work backwards. And we need to, to be grown up about the decisions that we're going to have to make. Um, but going back to the point I made before, I think it is also about looking at how we generate resources, and that's part of the difficult discussion um, in terms of looking at things like council tax, wealth tax. There are, there are areas that we aren't currently doing enough, I think, that, uh, that need to be explored as well. Presumably in three broad terms, we either take money from another budget, we cut the social security budget, or we raise more revenue. So I can, yeah, on you. I, I don't know why you would include the social security budget as one of the, the kind of binary choices in that. I think it, the, what we have just now is, and I think this is the, this is the debate that the whole parliament needs to stand up to. If the, if the deficit is in 27, 28, there's an election between then and now. So every party in this parliament, whether in government now or not, will have to face that up. And I think we face a debate as a parliament, as a society, because there are lots of things that the Scottish Government spend money on now. Could public services be more efficient? Are there little budget lines that we could all quibble about? Definitely. But does mo do most people in this parliament think we need a better social care system? Yes. Do most people in this parliament think we need a better childcare system? Yes. Do most people in this parliament think we need to support people's mental health better? Yes. We have a a debate to have in Scotland, the same debate, frankly, needs to happen in the UK, about the level of public services which people expect and how we contribute towards those. Doesn't, general taxation is one solution to that. doesn't need to be. We can look at contributions to different services. We can have universal provision of the service, but different people will contribute to that in some way. So I think we do, we need to get into these issues and I know there are there are pesky economists like Emma who will we will pull me up on things like this but we are spending an awful lot of money on treating the symptoms of poverty so for example we did cost of living polling earlier this year which showed that of the parents who have reported a decline in their mental health because of the cost of living crisis 30 percent of them have said it's because they're worrying about providing for their children these families don't have enough money if these families had enough money, we could bear down on the cost of the mental health support that these families would need. So ultimately, I think if we want to start to, to close those gaps, we need to have an honest debate about the level of provision that people expect. We need to significantly reduce poverty or we are driving demand into all of these public services which are already struggling. And I think we, we have got into a really unhealthy debate about 
whether you know, whether social security is the right thing to be spending money on. Our social security system in the UK at the minute is fundamentally inadequate. People are hungry in this country because of it. The UK government bear an enormous amount of responsibility for that. This parliament has stepped into some of that space with things like the Scottish child payment. That is a good thing. Yeah, um, very much echo what Chris has just said. Um, I think it has to be borne in mind that the statutory targets that exist for reducing child poverty weren't just set by the Scottish Government. They were set by this Parliament and they were set unanimously by this Parliament. Every single party and every single member in this Parliament supported the child poverty reduction targets. So, if we are to stand a realistic chance in meeting those targets, the Scottish Government will need to raise additional revenue because there is no way that can even meet its current service commitments with the budget that it has. So revenue will have to be raised. I think that is essential going forward. Um, we do want good public services. I think all the, the points that Chris has made about the costs to the NHS, enormous costs to the NHS of, of poverty, um, enormous costs to, to local authority uh, support services as well. Uh, in terms of poverty. Um, so we often get it reflected back to us as, as um, non-economists. So what would you do differently? <laughs> um, and that's a question better asked the Scottish Government. You know, they have the resources to say what the impacts will be on in terms of reprioritisation, because that is also going to need to take place. Um, the Commission, unfortunately, isn't best placed to say what a cut in the justice budget will do in terms of increased crime, etc. That's, that's something for the Scottish Government to answer. Where our expertise lies is these are the things you need to do to reduce poverty. Unless you pay for those things, it, poverty will not be reduced. You know, that's that's the, what we would reflect back to you. Um, so we, we do need to have a serious conversation about the level of taxation that is needed to provide good public services, but also to address the scourge of poverty in our society. Um, and we have previously provided advice on reprioritisation um, to the Scottish Government. You know, the Scottish Attainment Challenge Fund, for example, we have asked the question, might it be better spent? Uh, directly in reducing po child poverty rather than indirectly through allocation in, in individual schools to, to various things. Um, um, and a look again uh, at concessionary travel. You know, um, I myself have had concessionary travel for seven years now. I don't need it. Um, I'll be honest, you know, the income levels I've got, I don't need concessionary travel. And there's a lot of people who are working now who weren't working before who don't need it. Um, that money could then you know, be reprioritised to help low-income families get to work because the costs of getting back and forward to work are one of the barriers that, that people face, particularly part-time workers who can face £20, £30 pounds a week in, just in bus fares to get back and forward to their place of employment. If we could help them with that, it's one of the things that might help them move into work or take on more work than they're currently doing. So we need to think hard about, about reprioritisation, but we also need to think hard about taxation. Both local and wealth taxes have to be considered um, if we're going to generate the sort of income that we need for poverty reduction programmes. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to leave the point here, but um, we're really tight for time, and I am really keen to hear from the panel and, and, and obviously to allow the members to put questions to you as well. We've got till about 10.55, so just to make you aware of that. Um, so I'm now going to bring in Bob. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I shall endeavour to be as concise as possible. I want to look at the Scottish Government's policies and budgets and the impact that's had in relation to reducing or, dare I say, stopping an increase in child poverty levels. Um, so, but can I disaggregate those things? Policies that are working and the budgets around those policies, because 
they interact with each other, not quite the same thing. So maybe a couple of witnesses could put something on the record about the impact they think that the policies and the budgets of the Scottish Government are directing towards tackling child poverty, poverty and the impact they are having. Maybe to Mr Burt first, perhaps? Sure. Well, in, in terms of things that are working, uh, the Scottish Child Payment is working. Um, it is significantly reducing child poverty. There will be some people will give you various different numbers, but it, you know it's it's probably four or five percent at the moment. We don't see that reflected in the numbers yet because there's obviously other other factors which play in. But it will significantly reduce child poverty. That is a really good thing. Child poverty has been going up over the last few years. If it gets it going back down again, great. Um, the other, though, which is a bit more worrying in this budget is around housing. Because housing is, and, and Emma, actually, when she was at the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, did an excellent report, Poverty in Scotland 2019, which looked into the effect that investment in social housing in Scotland has had in keeping poverty levels lower than what we see elsewhere in the UK. So um, those are two areas where Scottish Government investment has made a significant difference. OK, thank you. And uh, Mr Scott's making eye contact with you. I think he wants to come in. Uh, I just, I, briefly. All I do is, is echo Chris on that point. You know, that, um, the Scottish Child Payment has made a, a significant difference and will continue to make a significant difference. But can't rely totally on Social Security to reduce poverty. That, that has to be emphasised. That's going back to the employability question. I think there are questions that have to be asked as whether the employability spend is doing all that it should be doing in terms of uh, moving the people who are in genuine poverty uh, into work and, or into better paid work, et cetera. And uh, you know, we, we should continue to examine whether that is good spending. You know, it, it, it's good that we are trying to move people in, 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 into well-paid work, but is, is it efficient? You know, um, are we getting value for the, for, the, for the money that we're putting into those programmes? Um, and in terms of reducing poverty, that, that's, that's, that should be the question, because you know, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in terms of people who are already very close to the employment market who are moved back into work. Those are not the people that um, need that support. So, you know, um, sometimes it takes longer um, to work with people who are facing multiple barriers. So we need we need to look at the programmes uh, through that sort of lens. Uh -huh. I, I'll, and housing is, is the other big one. It, it makes a huge reduction, uh, sorry, it makes a huge contribution to reducing poverty in Scotland. I think um, a, a and, and we need to continue to a point invest made, in social I, housing. I, I hate cutting across you, Mr Scott. My convener will have my guts for garters if I don't try to try keep questions moving, because I apologise. I've, I've got another question I wanted to ask me, the other one is in relation to this. And, and it's, in, it's in relation to, we know it's a challenge of financial context, a change of approach has to be taken by the Scottish Government because we don't have the budget for, for, for every eight and pair of the policy programme that would impact on child poverty. Give an example, one suggestion I have made, if we can't increase the Scottish child payment significantly above the £25 per week that we're already giving, poverty doesn't impact uh, uniformly across the course of a year. Could a summer supplement Scottish child payment make a difference for the lives of young people and families living in poverty. There's one idea. Is there another policy approach that you would like to recommend? You can throw that one out, you can support that one, but is there other approaches the government could take within a tight financial budget that could have a direct and significant impact, hopefully relatively speedily? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Thanks. So yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so there are different ways you could structure benefits. Um, I think the it's a cumulative impact of quite a lot of different things that will make the difference for households, and Scottish Government's getting better at modelling those things. But you could start to look at, for example, different um, payments to go to different types of households or those that are in severe poverty, those who are in destitution. So I think they are some of the areas you could look at if you want to increase 
increase the cost effectiveness of policies. But um, I think that would be one area. And just a very quick point on looking at what has had an impact over time. We are still lacking a lot of the evalu robust evaluation evidence that would allow us to really assess the effectiveness of policies such as um, childcare and employability. So it's, there's very little evidence that links that directly to child poverty. And we need that to be able to work out what to do next. OK, thanks. Thanks very much, Emma. I'm now going to bring in Katie Clark. Thanks. Thank you. And my question is to Emma. Um, because in your submission, you state in relation to child poverty, we need to see much more focus on delivery of policies that have an evidenced route towards realising the targets rather than small allocations in different pockets, which will not make a demonstrable difference. Can you explain in more detail how the Scottish Government should do this? But also, is there a danger that this approach might focus on policies that are easy to measure? Um, rather than potentially more impactful policies that are difficult to measure? Yeah, well, uh, I'll come to that last point. First, um, there are, as, as I, in my previous answer, it's the cumulative impact of different policies that will have that overall impact on getting people with quite complex circumstances above the poverty line. So they're not maybe on their own, you know, um, going to, to make that kind of, get them, get them over that poverty line. But the, the sort of contribution of different elements, say um, a bit more on um, the council tax reduction scheme, a bit more on the Scottish child payment, a targeted um, childcare offer. You can model all these things. They're difficult to do, um, but have some very really complex kind of um, policies brought together in order to understand the impact. The, the issue I've got over allocations of small pockets of money into funds is that none of that modelling has happened in those circumstances. The detail has not been worked through to actually look at how effective the money that's going to be spent through that fund is going to then be at getting people um, in over the poverty line into that kind of what the cumulative effect that that will have, along with all the other policies that that are being that are already there, that's the issue I have. And it's it's not a it's some funds are very good. Scottish Welfare Fund, you know, is very well directed. You know, it is more these kind of um, ten million here, twenty million there, which sounds really good on paper, but it doesn't actually always have that follow through in terms of what the the impacts are going to be. Um, and yeah, we shouldn't just do things that are easy to measure. But we can actually be a lot better at measuring some of some of the things that we do. Okay. And in terms of um, the sort of first part of the question about the more focus on an evidence route, can you maybe speak a little bit more about that in terms of what that actually means for the Scottish government? Like in the approach that we're already they've already started in terms of the um, best start bright futures i think that's the right name yeah um in terms of doing that the modeling exercise that they started that we also did in in um, the fraser valand institute as well um in collaboration with the um the commission and um, so it's actually being able to look at the cost effectiveness the number of children brought out of poverty per pound spent and you have to add everything into the pot in terms of the policies, look at different options, look at different scenarios, do that kind of options appraisal, which is um, inbuilt into the training of all government economists right. to find um, the best, the best, most cost effective route forward. I think the time for that has come, that really direct um, and focused exercise, because we are now really close to 2030, 31 in terms of meeting those targets. Mm -hmm. The time for pilots, experimentation, trying, you know, um, this, they're great. They give us lots of evidence, but we really need to start spending that money at scale mm -hmm. if those targets are going to be reached. Okay, thank you. OK, thanks very much, Emma. The next question is to Alison. And, and, and given the constrained uh, fiscal framework, to what extent would you prioritise further above, above inflation increases to the Scottish child payment? I think that, well, this question perhaps falls more in the realm of um, uh, the economists <laughs> sat to my right. But from, from a rights perspective, I mean, it appears that we, we are, you know, we're really based on an economic system that requires inequality. We're, we're, 
you know, is built on inequality. And, and um, I think from, from inequality and extreme poverty within society, de it demonstrates um, that we, we have human rights violations. The poverty is so inherently linked to poor housing, poor health determinants, poor educational outcomes. Um, and these all need to be viewed as potential human rights violations, issues with human rights. So the Scottish Government, they're, they're, they've got the obligation to try and deal with this. And I would again challenge this go-to prioritisation at the expense of looking at also the difficult question of um, resource generation. Um, but poverty is so multi-dimensional that the degree to which the evidence demonstrates that Scottish child payment is sufficient as a route to adequately and effectively tackle and dramatically reduce poverty, I think, as other colleagues have said, I think that you know, there is evidence that that has had an impact, but is it the silver bullet? And this is where the lack of evidence about other approaches, for me, we need to have more information. We need to know, we know that things like school meals are having an impact on children. You could argue that more nutritious school meals could have even more of an impact. Um, we know about the quality of school provision, about availability of school materials, about the impact of learning support in schools. So there's lots of different aspects um, and these all need to be measured coherently. So just increasing the amount of the actual payment without also addressing all of these other issues um, I can't give you an answer to that. I need to see more evidence in terms of, as Emma just described, looking at all of these different ways and what is going to contribute to the, the outcome that we want to see. What I will say is that direct payments are known to be one of the most dignified ways of providing support, but in and of itself, it won't solve child poverty because the structural deficits in children's lives um, are much deeper and wider than can be solved by just financial support. And I think with the state of public services that Chris mentioned before, the, you know, 15 years of austerity, they are no longer able to provide the support to deal with these wider inequalities. So um, I think all of this is important. Thank okay. you. Thanks very much. I'm now going to invite Marie McNair, who's joining us remotely. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning, panel. Thanks for your time. Uh, the programme for government committee to inflation linked upgrading of some benefits referring to increasing the Scottish child payment, penal support payment and all disability carers benefits in line with inflation. Do you expect all devolved social security benefits to be uprated by inflation? And just for completeness, do you expect the UK government to uprate all reserved social security benefits by inflation? And I'll pop that to, to Bill. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's, what, that's what the people who are living at the sharp end need at the very least is an uprating in line with inflation. Actually, the adequacy of universal credit needs to be addressed right now because the £20 uplift that we experienced during the pandemic, um, when that was lost, uh, plunged many, many families back into deep poverty. And, and as GRS research is showing, the numbers and the proportion of uh, children live in, in households living in deep poverty now where they cannot afford essentials is growing. Mm. Universal credit should at least be able to meet the needs for those essentials, food, energy, roof over your head, etc. And if it's not doing that, then it's failing to, to provide the security that social security is supposed to provide. So, yeah. Thanks, Bill. Um, just in the interest of time, I'll move on to my next question. Chris, in your written submission, you say that with regards to disability benefits, it will clearly have a significant impact on the Scottish Government budget if the UK Government fail to commit to a real terms uplift in these payments. Can you expand how uh, this impact will be significant? Well, I, I mean, Bill, Bill said, I mean, there are members of the UK Government talking about they didn't want to bankrupt ordinary families yesterday, well, they're already making them hungry through the inadequacy of the social security system. Sure. And as Bill has said, our, our analysis from earlier this year showed that poverty has deepened in the UK since the turn of the millennium. And one of the groups worst impacted by that have been disabled people. And mm. I, I, there is a longer term, um, a longer term bit of work we need to do about the adequacy of disability assistance. It's supposed to cover the additional costs of disability. There is lots of at least anecdotal evidence out there mm. that it's not. 
Um, and obviously, from the budget perspective, you know, it's the, it's the biggest line on Scottish Social Security funding. Now, if the UK government fail to uprate in real terms, then it causes a big problem for the Scottish government because they are already spending more sort of per head than, than the UK government on these payments already. So hopefully the UK government will do the right thing and they should, and then the Scottish government need to follow suit. Thanks, Chris. Just finally, uh, an equality opportunity community, new leadership, a fresh start. The First Minister stated that the Scottish Government would have to target every pound we spend and invest in order to get the maximum value, ensuring it reaches those who need it most. How should the Scottish Government determine who needs it most? And I'll just pop it back to yourself, Chris. Well, as, as I've said, I mean, we, we rightly focus on child poverty because we know the, the trauma that that can cause in, in young people's lives, which then, then plays out throughout their life. So we are absolutely right to focus on child poverty. However, if you look at, say, the, the people who are having to rely on, on food banks, etc., that's often working age single people and, again, disabled people. So I think, I mean, Emma and, and um, Dr. Rosie have put this um, more eloquently already. We need to have much better insight into the decisions that we could make. Who are the families who would, who would benefit most? Who are we going to prioritise in the immediate term and, and take it from there? Um, but there, there, you know, sadly, there is no right answer. There is no silver bullet, but there is a heck of a lot more we could do. Certainly wish there was, Chris. Um, Anyone else? Anyone else want to come in just before I hand back to convener? Um, I believe yeah. Dr. Fosey would Ready? like to come in. Sorry, um, Sorry. Dr. Fosey, I think you do it. <laughs> really, I think it, it is a tricky question, but I think it's also worth when we, we when we ask the question who needs it most is that there's different categories of vulnerability um, that can come from your lack of access to a right or to a service. So it's not a natural condition of the individual, but the condition that you are being subjected to because of a particular situation. So you could be vulnerable because you're homeless. You could be vulnerable because you, you have a lack of access to, to food. To, to housing, to education, there's a, the lack of access to a right puts you in a pl place of vulnerability. So that's one aspect, and we need to understand who those people are so that, that services can be better targeted. But the second part of that is that people um, can be vulnerable because of the conditions that they're in. So we know, for example, people in care, people who are deprived of their liberty, women and children who are fleeing domestic violence, are, are they're vulnerable because of their circumstances. And we need evidence. We need, back to evidence. We need to have more evidence about who, because the, the people who are vulnerable, this will change over time. There will be consistent, but there will also be changes. And with the crisis that we have with the cost of living, more and more people are finding themselves in positions of vulnerability. So we need more evidence and we need to listen to, we've got an incredibly strong civic society in Scotland who are shouting from the rooftops about who is vulnerable and who is in need of more support. So we need to be looking at the many, many submissions that your committees receive, that the government receives, that tell us over and again and help to inform that evidence base. So with many of the decisions in budgetary allocations, it's, you know, it's difficult to disagree because there are merits with decisions left, right and centre. But we need a framework for that decision making um, and the issue around understanding who needs it most we also need to have an adequate way of looking at this as i said before looking at the minimum core defining the minimum core defining it measuring it seeing who is or is not um, receiving that minimum level of, of um, service mm. provision okay thank you dr thank Cozy. You. i'm going to quickly bring in um, bill scott um, it, it would be remiss of me not to mention the six priority groups and six priority groups of families uh, the, those are lone parent families, families with a disabled adult or child, larger families with three or more children, minority ethnic families, and families with children under one. Uh, and lastly, families with a mother under the age of 25. 90% of all the children living in poverty are to be found in one of those families. Um, so there is a way of prioritising who needs the help most in terms of child poverty. Um, but I'd echo Chris in saying that some of the, the people who are suffering some of the worst impacts of deep poverty just now are young single people, disabled people, uh, etc. And, and that also needs to be prioritised in terms of protecting those who, at the moment, are facing not just choices between eating and eat, 
but just continuing to live um, because that, that's, that's what the calls to the, the helplines are telling us. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Bill. Bill. Um, now going to bring in Ross McCall. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, hello. Um, we've skirted on this already, but I would like to put a bit more detail, and it's to yourself, Bill, and also Emma, if you wouldn't mind just a wee comment. Um, in the submission um, on raising revenue in addition to prioritising spend, the Scottish Government will need to raise additional revenue to make full use of its devolved tax powers, is what you, you put in. Um, so I'd be interested in what you can explain your views on what the Government is not currently utilising its tax powers and what your tax working group is considering. And can I also put to you that, that there is a tax structure at the moment which might and can be used within devolved tax powers to change that structure. So I'd be also interested in whether that would be something that is worth actually looking at. So a little bit of a mix in there, but Bill and Emma, if you could go back on that. Yeah. Um, so at the end of last year, the Commission established a tax working group um, made up of members of the Commission, but also experts um, appointed to it from out with the Commission and uh, members of our lived experience panel and oh, sorry experts by experience panel and um, and then we called in expert witnesses uh, both from within government um, tax experts from private and public sector uh, etc and take, took evidence from them throughout the year uh, to try and come up with uh, some recommendations to government and where additional revenue might be secured um, to feed in to uh, child poverty reduction programmes. So um, we're nearing the end of that process. We'll um, be publishing next month. Um, but I am able to say some of the general uh, thoughts and findings of, of the, the tax working group. Um, we started by looking at the, how effective the current arrangements are and whether they were progressive. And our conclusion is that largely the Scottish Government's tax policies are progressive um, and, and that um, they, make, they make it a difference because the additional revenue being raised and the spending choices that have been made have tended to benefit lower income households. So they are redistributive. Um, but we think there's scope for more. And we really think that much more needs to be done because the fiscal sustainability challenge has already been pointed out, but also the scale of the ambitions in reducing child poverty demand that more resources are going to have to be put into those programmes if you're going to stand any realistic chance of meeting them by 2030. So in broad terms, we think there's limited further scope for tinkering or, or, or making adjustments, small adjustments to council tax bans and, and things like that. Uh, the scale of the challenge is much bigger and, and you're absolutely right. We need to look at not just tweaks to the current system, but uh, a redesign um, for the short and longer term. Um, and part of that will relate to local taxation uh, because that's one of the areas where it's easiest to make changes. Um, but we need to get those changes right for the long, medium and longer term and therefore a quick fix isn't the, the way to go about it. So we um, will be favouring uh, a re-evaluation re of properties because none has been carried out since 1991. And if we went ahead um, and, and made changes to local taxation, some of the people who should be paying more would not be paying more because we, 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 we haven't revalued, and some of the people who um, shouldn't be paying more would be paying more because, because their properties um, have been built at a certain time or, or were valued at a certain time. So we, we need a revaluation to be carried out urgently um, so that we can have a proper basis for looking at local taxation and in the round and making plans for the medium and longer term to raise proper levels of funding from local taxation and, and to meet local service demand. Um, we also need, I think, to see some devolution of further powers on, um, through agreement with the UK Government, focusing on powers that are complementary to those that we already have. 
Thank you, Bill. I'm sorry to, to cut off, but I'm really interested to, to hear what Emma's got All to right. say. I think so, I've got the gist of what you're saying, but uh, if I don't get a chance to see ah, Emma, sorry. then we're going to have to move on. So, very quickly, we, we would favour uh, um, devolving powers over savings and dividend income um, so that uh, we close off one of the ways that you can avoid paying income tax uh, on, on earnings by you know, putting into a company rather than uh, paying, paying yourself a salary. But I'll, I'll let Emma come in. Um, I, I won't add much. I mean, I, um, we are involved in the, the tax advisory group that the Scottish Government has set up um, to look at some of, of, of these things as well. I mean, I think just I'll just touch on one point, and um, we've talked a lot about evidence today and how we need more evidence. One place there is a lot of evidence is around council tax and the choices that could be made to make it more progressive. And, and, and this can't, that can't be done without a revaluation because it totally undermines and makes this, the system um, potentially... Well, it, it starts to just undermine the whole purpose of the system. So we very much echo that um, that, that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now moving on, I'm going to invite James Dornan in, who has joined us remotely. And again, we are really tight for time, so <laughs> um, can we be as concise as possible? Thanks. That's me being told. Thank you, Convener. Uh, the committee re recently uh, has received evidence highlighting concerns about transparency of the budget. Have there been any improvements in the, in the transparency? Uh, and what more needs to be improved in the budget process? Uh, I think I'll start with Emma. Thank you. Um, so I would say, yes, there have been some improvements over time. Um, a number of us are involved in the Equality and Human Rights Budget Advisory Group, and a lot of our um, recommendations through that, through how to improve and make more useful the Equality and Human and Fair Scotland budget statement, I think it's called, um, have been taken on board. Um, I also mentioned in my submission that we're aware that there is more being done to look at um, modelling and presenting the distributional impact of both tax, social security and spend. And we're looking forward to seeing the results of that in, a, in hopefully this budget, certainly in the future. Um, there is more that, that can be done. I mean, um, I think I would refer you to, to comments made in uh, for my colleagues at, at Finance Committee for some of the technical <laughs> details on that, but we have spoken quite a lot about the presentation of data. I think one final point would be it can be um, quite difficult to navigate through the budget documents to understand what is new spending and what is existing spending mm -hmm. that's um, either continuing or is... Um, just being re-announced. So we would uh, really appreciate um, a much more concise um, budget document that, that concentrated on, on the new decisions that had been made for that financial year. And do you think that's a realistic um, plan, given the financial and time pressures in preparing the budget? Yes, um, I do, because a lot of the work for the budget um, is an, a year-long process. It is a lot of the decisions that, that, that come through in the budget documents are, will have been through a policy-making pro process beforehand, so a lot of these analyses can be done in advance. Um, of course, there are the time pressures with the UK um, budget um, or, or the UK details for the Scottish budget only coming through a few weeks in advance, but it's... Um, a lot of these issues that we have around transparency could be prepared in advance and therefore when the final decisions can be taken in those final few weeks, um, it's all ready to go. Um, so it's not an issue around those time pressures from our point of view. It's an issue with um, the approach taken to, to, to writing um, and preparing the budget. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, Convener, I've got a, a question for Dr Hosey. Um, the Scottish Human Rights Commission makes suggestions as to how the committee can practically take a rights-based approach to budget scrutiny. Can you outline the main points the committee should be considering taking this approach? 
I will do, if I have the liberty, just to quickly add to that last question around transparency, because that's a key area of our work. We are currently repeating the open budget survey of the Scottish budget, and we did this process four years ago, and in May next year we'll be publishing our results, um, which do at the moment show in the draft form that, that there have been some progresses made in terms of transparency of the Scottish budget. And the positive for me is that the Scottish Government has committed this time round to actually engaging with the process and to committing to looking at the recommendations that we're going to come out with in relation to improving transparency, participation and accountability of the budget. Last time round, the government didn't engage with the process at all. So I think it does show that there is a willingness to engage and that fiscal transparency has been taken seriously. Um, in relation to your question, in relation to, to taking a rights-based approach, um, you, you've obviously seen my, my written evidence, and I tried to set out um, not the whole framework, but the, the three sort of steps that, that can be taken in terms of rights-based scrutiny. Um, we look at the, what, what commitments do the government have. Now, at the moment, we, we are signed up to a range of international treaties. Some of those are going to be incorporated through the Human Rights Bill. Um, very soon. And, you know, what lies within those rights? What are the contents of those rights? What are the minimum obligations? And what are we aspiring to progress over time in terms of rights realisation? And then looking at the, the treaty bodies who critique the government every four to five years periodically um, about their, their progress. Um, what do they say that we're doing well and what do they say that we're needing to improve on? They highlight a range of areas across all of the committees. There's a lot of synergy in what they say. Um, but particularly around economic and social rights, we were presenting to the, the UN earlier this year and we highlighted a range of areas where um, we need to see improvement, particularly in and around um, poverty and inequality. And so looking to what they say back to us, what we need to do, that's a key source of information as to what you need to be challenging the Scottish Government on in terms of their human rights record. And then considering the resources that are required to deliver on those commitments before you're finally agreeing how the necessary resources are going to be generated. So back to this, you know, what is it we're trying to achieve? What are we not doing well we need to improve on? How do we achieve that? What resources are required? And how do we generate those resources? Um, we've talked a lot about child poverty today, and I think that that is a, you know, a key example. The, the UNCRC reviewed um, Scotland's record recently, and child poverty was yet again raised as you know, a significant issue for the committee. And we need to be asking, you need to be asking the government, um, what are they doing in relation to reducing the legal duties that they've set themselves on child poverty? What are they doing? What are they going to fundamentally change about the way that they're currently budgeting to tackle child poverty to demonstrate that they will have an impact on that statutory duty? What evidence can they produce to demonstrate that the, the act of impact these obligations have on budgetary decision making? So taking that evidence and applying it with the questions you ask of government, Government. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Under normal circumstances, there's quite a lot I'd like to come back on, but uh, given the time restrictions and given I'm scared of the convener, I'll just pass back. Yeah, <laughs> that was the right choice. Thanks, James. <laughs> um, now, finally, going to bring in Paul O'Kane for the last question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. And I suppose I'll return to a theme that I, I maybe started with, um, or we, we heard some response on, which was that engagement of people with lived experience and the public in terms of setting these priorities. Um, Bill, obviously you talked about um, some of those priorities perhaps being revised. Um, I just wonder how can we better hear what the public and people with lived experience have to tell us and prioritise their views of the budget? Well, uh it's fundamental to the, the Commission's priorities that people with lived experience of poverty are not only involved in commenting afterwards, after decisions have been made, because then it's too late, um, but actually involved right at the start in developing and designing solutions to, to the poverty that they face. So the budget is one of the key areas where they should be involved. There are real challenges to doing so, um, as we've already said. Some of the budget documents are very opaque still and difficult even for people with technical experience to, to understand and pick out what is changing and what isn't changing. And that's one of the things we think the Scottish Government could do better is, is setting out whether there are new areas to spend, why is that be, being done, what, what's it about, if there are reductions, again, why is that being done, what are the likely consequences? Because if the, if the other areas are largely unchanged, 
We don't really need to hear so much about them, but we do need to know where the changes are. Um, but the Parliament itself has got a critical role, I think, in, in assisting Scottish Government in that process. And the Citizens' Participation and Public Petitions Committee have issued a report on em embedding public participation in the work of the Parliament. And I, and I think you know, one of the things you could do is, is look to how do we involve people with lived experience in pre-budget scrutiny work? Um, because, again, it's of fundamental importance to their lives what happens in the forthcoming budget. They should, they should have some input in, into how the Scottish Government is prioritising spending. Yeah. Um, stop you there, Bill, because I'm keen I'm, to hear I'm just, from I'm Chris just as well. There anyway. Thanks. And I, I, I appreciate Chris hasn't come in for a while, so if you want to have your final say there, Chris, on that. Um. Yeah, I think, I mean, Bill's right about the kind of direct engagement of people with lived experience, but they're also, and I'm sure you all see this in your own constituencies and areas that you represent, is there are third sector organisations and local public sector staff who will have deep knowledge of what's happening in their communities as well. And how we, you know, when, when Emma was talking about evidence which is available for, for national decision making, this is a huge untapped resource which, which we have. We have, you know, I, I think our, our politicians in this parliament are often much better connected to their communities than, than they are elsewhere. And that, that's hard work, you, which you'll know better than me. But I think as well, being able to speak to third sector organisations who understand their communities better than, better than anyone is another really fruitful way of getting insight which the Parliament can then use. Okay, thank you very much. And that actually um, brings us to the end of our scrutiny session today. And I wanted to say thank you so much for joining us as well. And um, I'm sorry if we were so tight for time. It's such a wide ranging, important topic that we're that, that we're discussing today. So uh, what I would suggest is that, um, and I know that Roz had, had, had a question that she wasn't able to put forward in terms of the, the concept of wellbeing economy as well. So I'm happy if you want to put forward any written submissions um, af after we leave here today. Um, so again, thank you very much. Um, and, and, and we'll end this session today. Thank you. <laughs>